Well, good morning again. Last week, we began a new message series entitled Sacred Selfie. This Sacred Selfie series will take us through the end of October and the first week of November. And then we'll begin a series on Nehemiah, but first things first. Last week, when we started our Sacred Selfie series, <laughs> that last sip of coffee did the trick, I think. When we began our Sacred Selfie series, we talked about identity in Christ. And we started with the idea that so often we allow our identity to get intertwined and maybe even enmeshed, to use that word, with certain ideas and things that really we have so little control over or bring uh, much value to ourselves uh, in this world. Now, I, um, the reason I may seem a little bit sluggish last night is uh, I, I stayed up late watching the Alabama game. The only problem with that is I'm a diehard Georgia fan. So, roll tide, right? Was that was that Daniel? Okay, yeah. And so, I, and I learned it was Lindsay that gave the roll tide last week. I couldn't tell. Okay, so very good. So, um, go dogs, sick them. Um, I got. I'll tell you this. Little, I will tell you this a little, little quick funny. Uh, a couple years ago, when Georgia was playing Alabama for the national championship, we taught Mia to say go dogs. But you know what was happening at that time of year is right after Christmas, right? So we would say, Mia, go dogs, sick them. And so Mia was like, go dogs, sick them. Ho, ho, ho. Right after Christmas. And I'm like, baby, that'd be the best Christmas gift that Santa could bring me. But anyway, uh, Santa brought other things that year, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, but still, it's, it, I, I laughed about that. Last night, we we just had a little had a little chuckle about it. You know, go dogs, sick them. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, that was just the, the personality and the, the, the flavor of that little child. But anyway, so starting with our identity, you know, oftentimes we allow our identity to get wrapped up in like our sports teams, our political affiliations, places we live, things we drive, salaries that we earn, those types of things. We allow our identities to get wrapped up in things that really don't deserve that level of affection or attention. But it's just all part of our natural human inclination. So as we kicked off our Sacred Selfie series, we talked about how we are created in the image of God. We're created in the image of Jesus. And for the sake of being the reflection of God's image in the world, and as a result, when we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are recreated with the task of reflecting the image of God back out into creation. And therefore, it is imperative that what we do is we allow our identity to be wrapped up in the fact that we are created and redeemed and restored for ministry by God's one and only Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I get chills thinking about that. It's so awesome. But it's also kind of hard, isn't it? Because of the things of this earth that even God gives us to enjoy, things like, like football games and, and food and entertainment and, uh, and tech and toys and things like that. God doesn't want us to... to throw that, all that stuff away. He just doesn't want it to become our priority. He doesn't want it to become our focus. He wants it to add flavor to life, but not to become the focus of life. And so as we introduced the series about finding your identity in Christ, we talked about three different ideas or strategies, if you will, in terms of trying to help identify our identity in Christ and live into it, into our task of reflecting God's image back into creation. The first thing he, we talked about last week is changing the chase, right? So often we chase the desires of our flesh. Jesus wants us to chase the desires of God's heart. The second thing we talked about is giving us courage. When we find ourselves fearful or afraid, the presence of Christ can give us much-needed courage to do the right thing, even and especially when it's the hard thing. And so your identity in Christ can give you courage to face the future unafraid. And the third thing is to give you perspective that we are called to live lives that exist in eternity, not just in the temporal and temporary existence that we see and experience around us. We need to know that we are to chase after things that brings joy to God's heart, to have the courage to do the hard thing, and also to realize that our life is brought up in the eternal, not just the temporary and the temporal things that we have right here in front of us. And so that's how we're going to segue into our second installment of our Sacred Selfie series, is looking at the things that happen when we pay too much attention to the temporal, to the temporary. It's about comparisons. 
Have you ever found yourself guilty of comparing your life to someone else's? I mean, come on, right? It's a natural human thing. It's part of our human nature. There are some evolutionary tendencies that come through this, ways that we existed in a, in a tribal neighbor, a neighborhood, in a tribal mentality where everyone had a certain role to play for the survival of the tribe, for the survival of the group, the organization. We have these comparisons in our mind where we are constantly trying to figure out where do we fit and where should we sit. All of this has to do with where we are. And so as we move into our modern day sake of living or uh, stance of living, we are still confronted by the tendency of comparing our lives with others. Comparing our lives with others. Now I think, not really in a great way, Social media has had a huge role to play in the last decade or so of the way that we look at comparisons. Now, for example, if I were to give you my unlocked cell phone and tell you that you had carte blanche authority to scroll my camera feed, you would see all kinds of pictures. Now, they're all appropriate. Just some of them I might not be quite as eager for you to see, like some of my nerdy superhero things that I use as wallpapers on occasion when I'm feeling like I need to channel a little Superman's power or something, right, you know? That's only partially a joke. But there are also some pictures that I took that weren't quite right, wasn't quite the look I was looking for. Uh, maybe they were a little blurry, overexposed, underexposed, and maybe there were some of those selfies that I took with my family or just by myself. I'm like, ooh, I hope no one ever sees this. And for some reason, I've not yet taken the step to delete it. So you could look through my camera roll and see a thousand some odd pictures, and I would be happy for you to look at a small fraction of those. However, if you log into my Facebook page and you go through my pictures, what will you see? Perfection or as much perfection as I can muster, right? <laughs> I thought that was funny. Anyway, so you, you would see the pictures that I want you to see. And so the temptation in that is to think that if you're only scrolling my social media feeds, that my life is perfection. I mean, sure. I mean, I dress awesome. That's debatable. I, I, I get it. You know, I mean, it's... I'm joking. I could go through a whole litany of things to make fun of myself, but you're probably already processing that in your mind, so I don't need to fill in any blanks for you. But the reality is, is that you, when we look at other people through the lens of how they want to present themselves to you and to us, we run the risk of thinking that those little snapshots in time are reality. However, are they reality? No, because like the family picture that looks perfect has nothing to do with the maybe a hundred different clicks that it took to get everyone to quit picking their nose or looking off or closing eyes or whatever, screaming, pulling out their hair. But it's that one picture that we present that gives this idea, this indication that we've got it all together. And that's how we present our lives so often. We present our lives the way that we want other people to see us and to think that is how our life really is. And so social media has played a huge role in this idea of how we are comparing our lives with other people. But I've got to ask this question, is it healthy? No, because in the same amount of time, we've seen rates of anxiety and depression and even suicide at this stratospheric rise. It is not healthy for us to judge the totality of our lives on the little sliver of things that other people are giving us in which to judge. But we oftentimes lose the perspective. So we thought about that last week, right? We lose the perspective be, to be able to tell the difference. That that perfect family photo that was taken at the pumpkin patch with the leaves just perfectly behind was really just one of like a thousand pictures and the only one that turned out right. We lose that perspective. So we have to be careful with the way that we look at comparisons in our life. And that's because we talked about identity in Christ and how God created each and every one of us in his image. Every single one of us is created by God to do wonderful, awesome things, to be wonderful and to be awesome in and of ourselves. 
And so when we lose sight of that by comparing our lives to someone else, we are losing sight of the glory of who God is and how God created you and me to live within this world. And that brings me back to that, I refer to it a lot, but that poster that I saw in my childhood Sunday school class where it said, God made me and God don't make junk. But sometimes we need to be reminded of that because we are constantly comparing ourselves, for better or for worse, with other people based on the way that we see ourselves. More on that in a moment. Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, says these words. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now, what is it that the Apostle Paul, writing this verse, or these verses in Galatians, what is, what is God trying to convey to us through Paul? Interactive message time. What do you think? What is God trying to convey to us through Paul? Anybody? I hear all the people online, but I want to, you know, the folks here. <laughs> what do you think? God made each and every one of us for a very specific purpose, right? And as a result, we are called to live according to the way that God has molded and shaped us. And as we live our lives based on the way that God molded it and shaped us, we are accountable to the way that God made us, not necessarily accountable to the way that God made somebody else. In the scripture, we get these images a couple times about how God is the potter and we are the clay. I believe it's in Job when God and Job are having their repartee and God looks at Job and he says, what role is it that the clay has to look at the potter and says, no, no, I don't like the way that you're making me. I'd rather be a chalice than an ashtray. What God is saying is that everything has a purpose. Everything has a role to play. Every single one of us is created in God's image and made for a purpose. And we must test our own actions based on the way that God created us, not on the way that God created somebody else. For example, I am a big baseball fan. I will never be able to hit a ball as hard as Freddie Freeman. And to be honest with you, when I go to a batting cage and play against like some of those uh, professional like batting machines, I can't even make contact, let alone make uh, you know, hit the ball well. I will never be able to do the things on a baseball field that Freddie Freeman can do. But I don't know that Freddie Freeman can do the things in a pulpit that I can do. And so it's not about testing our actions based on someone else who we perceive to be the ideal. It's about being true to one's own self. And so God wants you to be true to yourself based on the way that he created you and the way that he has redeemed you and the way that he is restoring you to reflect his image back to creation. Is that clear? Now, is that awesome? I hope it is. Because if we sit back and we compare ourselves based on other people's abilities, we may feel badly about ourselves while losing sight of the things that God made us that only we can do very, very well. So this leads us to our next point. Comparisons lead to coveting. Comparisons lead to coveting. Now, coveting isn't a word that we use very often in our modern day nomenclature and our lexicons. We don't talk about coveting all that very often. But I want to give you the idea, the definition of what coveting means. means. Coveting is a burning desire to acquire. A burning desire to acquire. That's what coveting means. Now, one way to think about this is from the Lord of the Rings. And I got to give a shout out, Rob, right? Lord of the Rings, the creature Gollum, Gollum, right? He was intent upon getting the ring of power, right? He wanted that ring of power. And his desire for that ring consumed him. He had a burning desire to acquire. But what ended up happening to him? He got the ring of power, didn't he? As he was falling into Mount Doom. And his burning desire to acquire the ring ended up burning him up. Friends, the same thing happens to us when we are consumed with covetousness, covetousness or coveting. When we feel like we have to achieve or acquire something else. That becomes our goal. That becomes our pursuit. We have this burning desire to acquire. Now there's a reason that God doesn't think this is very good behavior. And he actually gave us a rule about it in the Ten Commandments. It's the Tenth Commandment. When God tells Moses to tell the people of Israel, thou shalt not, right? Thou shalt not 
covet. But he goes on to say, thou shalt not covet like your neighbor's ox, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's Maserati, your neighbor's big screen TV, your neighbor's allegiance to a certain ball team that never seems to lose against your own team, right? Thou shalt not covet. And what is the reason behind coveting? It's because, here it is, I'm going to let you in a little human nature, right? It's because our focus goes to the things and not the person, the relationship. If we are coveting our neighbor's belongings or our neighbor's lifestyle, we've moved beyond the neighbor and the relationship to the things that the neighbor has. And this is not good. Because God created us to live a relational, connected life. And the things about our neighbor that we see the only value in is the stuff that they have. Then we've moved beyond the relationship and into the material. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to be connected with each other, not for the sake of what type of a transactional benefit we may receive from somebody else, but for the sake of being in that relationship together, being connected. And then we can maximize one person's strengths to help cover another person's weaknesses because God is placing us all together in the way that he wants for us. Let's say, so coveting is a just a quick review. Coveting is the burning desire to acquire that will burn us up if we're not careful because we are looking at the things and not the people. There's this old wisdom saying that says we are called to love people and use things, but all too often we use people and love things. And we've got to get that right because our neighbors, the people who we do life with, regardless of whatever it is that they may have, it's the relationship that is most important, not the material trinkets and tokens and toys. But bringing it back to the idea of comparison, what happens when we focus on the things? We begin to ascribe value to people based on their things, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. We begin to ascribe a person's value based on the things that he or she has. And so these are the pitfalls or the problems with comparing. They cause us to feel on one hand as though we are better than someone else. When we are comparing ourselves to someone who we perceive to be at a lesser status or station, then we compare ourselves and feel as though we are better than someone else. Perhaps you remember a couple of weeks ago when I talked about the lifeboat theory. The lifeboat theory says that as we're going through life, we are constantly comparing and ordering people in our minds in such a way so that we feel better as long as we deserve the last seat on the, on the lifeboat. That's not to say that we don't want the first seat, but as long as that we can deserve a seat ahead of somebody else, we can at least feel better about ourselves to some degree. And this plays into comparison as the way that we're constantly looking, engaging, and judging other people. It reminds me of the story that I once heard about these two guys that are out in the woods, and they ran. A, they came upon a bear, and they both started running. One guy looks at him, looks at the other and says, "There's no way you cannot run a bear. You know they can run like three hundred thousand miles an hour, or whatever." That's not, it's not actually true. I don't know how fast a bear can run, but I know a bear can run typically faster than a person and climb a tree. And the other guy looks at the other and says, "Well, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to have to outrun you, right?" So. Uh, I think the 9 o'clock service found that a little bit funnier, but I, I'm not comparing congregation or services by any means. Don't you think, right? Don't you think? It's not a comparison. Oh, dear Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. All right, so the whole comparison thing, right? It's like, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. We feel better about ourselves when we compare. But the inverse is also true. For when we compare and we see things that we feel other people have that we believe that we want or even worse deserve, we can feel worse about ourselves. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I really wanted that new car or that ball game to win or I really wanted something else. Why have you forsaken me? How often are we internalizing and personalizing stuff that is of so little consequence? It's a lot, it's frequent. And when we feel less of ourselves because of a comparison based on somebody or something else, especially those things over which we have no control, then we are denying the image of God by which we are created. And that, my friends, 
It's scary how frequently we do that. But what's the sin in it? Is it a lack of contentment? Oh, sure. God wants you to live with contentment based on how God has given and blessed and equipped you to live in this world. But what is the greater sin? It's to miss the identity into which we are created, but it is also to misplace the standard by which we live. Now listen to this, friends. It is to misplace the standard by which we live. When your life is consumed with comparing and contrasting other people, who's the standard? Self, right? It's, I feel like I am better than so-and-so because I have this or I've done this or I've achieved this, I've acquired this, or if I feel less than somebody else because they've achieved, they've acquired, they've accomplished. The standard is self, not the Savior. Jesus is the standard by which we are called to live, by which we are called to order our lives. This goes back to creation when God created humanity in his own image. And the new creation that Christ creates you or turns you into when you accept him as Lord and Savior of your life and he redeems and restores your life for the sake of reflecting his image back to God and to creation. So we've got to revisit this whole idea of desire I talked about last week. We've got to revisit this whole idea of, of desire and to desire to be the person who God has created and called us to live. In Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 9, Solomon wrote, It's better to enjoy what's at hand than to have an insatiable appetite, a burning desire to acquire, in other words. This too is pointless. It's just chasing wind. Now, Jesus talked about wind a little bit in John chapter 3. He says you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. What happens when our pursuit is after the wind over things that we can't see is we are constantly behind. We are constantly in arrears on trying to achieve or accomplish something. We're always chasing after something that is arbitrary and unpredictable. But if we look at the wind as the Holy Spirit and we say, dear Holy Spirit, be the sail in my life, then God is propelling us forward. God is moving us forward to the places he wants us to be. We become spiritual pioneers when we aren't setting ourselves up as the standard, but Jesus Christ and allowing him to be the power by which we live and move and find our being in God. It's not just chasing after the wind, it's chasing the Spirit. It's chasing God to say, God, use me, take me, send me, mold me, shape me. No longer do I want to be the, the ashtray or the cup that's complaining about the role that I've been given. But it's, Lord, mold me by thy hands and help me to be the vessel that you've created me to be. And then Jesus refers to this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, during the Sermon on the Mount. He said, instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. That's a beautiful promise. we got to be careful. Lest we think that the things that Jesus wants to add to us are the temporary temporal things that really mean very little, matter not at all. The things that we tend to covet, the stuff, without recognizing that what God is trying to get us to do is focus on the relationship and the connectivity that we are called to live into with him and other people. C.S. Lewis talked about how the start of friendship begins with two words. You two, not the Irish rock band, but you as well. See, that's three words, so you two works better. That's what C.S. Lewis said, that the start of friendship says you two. Last week as we closed the message, we talked about how Peter said, I don't want you to think that these struggles or these trials that you're going through are strange. In other words, to think that you were the only one who was going through the difficulties that you're going through. God wants us to connect with other people and to do life with other people. So even in those times when we are suffering, when we are alone, when we feel as though the world is against us, we recognize that we are not alone. That he has sent Jesus to be with us and other people are going through similar things that connect with us. And we become stronger and we become better equipped to deal with the craziness of life. We become co-laborers. Become sufferers, which leads to compassion and contentment. And then our focus isn't just on the stuff that we think should be better in our lives. 
but it's the people who God is weaving us together into this tapestry where we become the support for other people who are suffering and may not be as far down the road as we are or have gone a step or two farther down that road where we can come together hand in hand, arm in arm, prayer in prayer and know that here we are together and that because another person has perhaps endured something, we too will get through it. Friends, getting a whole new perspective on the world in the Sacred Selfie series is really about allowing our desires to sync up with the desire of God and not comparing ourselves with other people who we feel like maybe they are farther along than where we are or where we wish we could be. But it's about linking together relationally with God and others so that we may accomplish the things that God has called and asked us to do. We have to fight that temptation to think that we are better than someone else or less than someone else because we aren't exactly where we feel that someone else is. But even in those moments where we think someone has it all together, their life probably looks a lot more like the camera roll than it does the Instagram post. That it takes many steps and many takes to get to those spots and those points that we have lifted up as the standard by which to judge perfection. Because it's not about us. It's about who God is and what he's done, how he's created you and me in his image. He's redeemed us and restored us and given us, a, given us the task of reflecting his image back into creation. So as we draw this message to a close, I want you to think about how God can use the things that you have gone through or you are going through right now to help connect with someone else, to offer that you too, and to find the beginning of a friendship, of a relationship, where you can do what the ministry of Hope Church is really all about, to introduce someone to Jesus. And through your experience and through your passion, fuel their love for him. To come to this point, we recognize, even though we may be struggling, our struggles are not the end. We are created to be eternal creatures. So let us not get so wrapped up and warped by the things that we see right in front of us, but to choose to live our life with an eternal perspective. Because God is real, and he loves you, and he has a plan and a purpose for your life that includes the difficulties, that includes the sadness, it includes the suffering, but it also includes the victories. It includes the laughter, and it includes the cheers. So however it is that you find yourself here today, I want you to know that you can find yourself here at God's altar to come and connect with him right where you are. Not feeling as though you have to compare yourself to someone else to feel better about your, your condition or to feel worse about your circumstances. But to be honestly and truly here and allow the grace of God, those nail-scarred hands that took the cross so that your sin could be defeated, those are the same hands that are wiping the tears from your face and are redeeming and restoring you for ministry in his kingdom. So as we bring this message to a close and the band closes with an awesome song today, I want you to come and feel comfortable to kneel at the altar, spend some time with God and pray about the comparisons that you're guilty of living into. Thinking of yourself as better than someone else or worse than someone else. And not allowing your current circumstances to be the standard by which you live, but to point you to the relationship that Jesus wants you to have with him and with the other people he's given you to do life with. So in his name, may we close this message, but open our life up to the opportunity of what will happen when we give our lives over to God. If you're with us online, I would just encourage you where you are to to pause and to pray. Maybe kneel right where you are if it's a place that's comfortable or safe to do so. And ask God to be with you and to help you deal with that standard that he has set for us in Jesus. Will you join me in prayer now and we'll open the altar. Almighty God, thank you for today and thank you for this place of hope. Lord God, however it is that we find ourselves here, whether we are at the summit of the mountaintop 
for we're somewhere deep in the valley of the shadow of death. We know that you are here with us. Lord, I pray a prayer of forgiveness for those who feel that we are better or worse because of a condition or circumstance that we're having to battle and engage. But Lord, help us to put our focus on you and to know that it is through suffering and service and sacrifice that we come to know the true depth of living a life yoked with you. And so, Lord God, through the prayers, through the songs, through our just being here present in this moment, I pray for an awareness and an awakening to take place in our lives that we are not about comparing ourselves to some arbitrary standard, but to you, the Savior of the world. For it's the name of Jesus I lift this prayer. Amen.